Hey there, welcome to the Online Course Master Show, where you learn how to create, publish, and promote your online courses. I'm your host, Phil Ebener, and today I'm with Jeremy Deegan, diving into another great topic, actually publishing and putting your course together. We're going to be going over everything that happens when you actually put your course on a platform like Udemy and also other platforms. As always, visit OnlineCourseMasters.com for show notes to view the video episode version of this episode and to see an archive of all our past episodes and guests. We, of course, appreciate any reviews and ratings you leave us and anybody that subscribes on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Radio, Google Play, wherever you're listening to this. If you're watching this on YouTube, give us a thumbs up and a like. And of course, head over to OnlineCourseMasters.com and hit that community button at the top to join our exclusive Facebook group for the Online Course Masters community. Jeremy, welcome back to the show. And uh, we were just talking about you finishing up courses. I guess I'm going to ask a tough question. What is it that is holding you back right now from creating more courses and getting them actually published? Oh, man, it, it goes back to the discussion we had on uh, perfectionism. Uh, just I always get bogged down with trying to do too much. Uh, we were talking about the fact that when I first started making courses, when you're first learning, it's exciting and you just grab a microphone and you hit the record button and you don't know what to say and you just kind of fumble through it, but you make it work. Uh, that was my first courses. As time goes on, you want to start perfecting things. You want to make the lighting better and the video better, and you spend more time on outlining and scripting and all the resources that you think that you could add to the course. And you just, uh, I get kind of bogged down in all those details, and I need to go back to the roots of just, you know, what am I teaching? How can I teach it? And and not make it too complicated. And so, um, I'm always surprised by how many uh, courses that you're always publishing. It's like every two or three weeks, I in my email box, Phil published a new <laughs> course. <laughs> it's like, how is he doing it? <laughs> I mean, I and think a lot not, of it, not, a lot of it is, um, you know, setting up your system and your studio or your environment to be able to record and be efficient and quick at just being able to hit record and start recording. Uh, part of it is letting go of that perfectionism, which everyone has a little bit of. Um, I partner with a lot of co-instructors, so a lot of my courses that I teach, we are balancing the work together. So it's not just me, uh, myself, creating these courses all of the time. Um, but I do, I totally get that it's hard. But it, I think the thing that you have to look at, and for people listening, you might look back on some of the old courses that you created that you might think, oh, the quality wasn't that great. But you see that, and I'm going to share it. Hopefully, this is okay. But like one of our courses that we just taught together um, a while ago that we didn't put a ton of time into, but I think it's a really great course. It's the Photoshop for Entrepreneurs course, where it was really just 11 projects that were geared towards entrepreneurs. And we taught Photoshop using those uh, 11 projects. It's almost about to pass $10,000 in revenue for each of us. And that course probably took less than a month for us to put together. And uh, it really is just choosing a topic that's interesting and getting the content out there. At the end of the day, if students are, are learning, then that's more important than the lighting or the intro graphics or sure. having everything um, being perfect. So. Well, that's why that, that course, I think, is so impactful for people because we're telling a specific thing that people want to know. How, like, how do I make a YouTube thumbnail in Photoshop? And we just outline it. It's it's not basic, but, you know, it's pretty just – it's just – this is what you do. We show yeah. them how to do it. And like, I'm, I'm not really impressed with my actual like talking head videos in that course. I'd like to go back and redo them, but people don't care about that. They yeah. want to know how to make a YouTube thumbnail. We give them the information. They enjoy it. They always leave good reviews. I mean, $10,000 each. We're on Udemy as co-instructors. That means Udemy is taking a 50% cut. You get 25, I get 25. So $10,000, that course has sold $40,000 in revenue. I mean, that's mm -hmm. pretty amazing. And we made that course like two years ago, and it's yeah. still to this day making money. So uh, it's just a powerful 
uh, the power of having online products and, and informational products and digital products that you can create these things and just over time they just keep generating <laughs> income and, and it's, and it's, it's still probably going to sell for for a while um, probably for the next couple of years at least and that's that's pretty awesome um, mm-hmm. so that was a little detour but today's episode <laughs> is about actually putting together your course online and we're going to be really using Udemy as the structure. Uh, last In last week's episode, I know I mentioned that this week we would be talking about landing pages. We're actually going to be talking about that next week in next week's episode. We figured it was such a big topic that we wanted to dedicate an entire episode to it. So next week, we're going to be basically going over an anatomy of a good landing page. Great if you're self-hosting. Now in this episode, we're talking about putting together your course. So talking about uploading, choosing um, things like categories, uh, URL, putting together course welcome messages, and a lot of the things that you have on Udemy, but can also be used off of Udemy as well. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is now people have learned how to create their course. They've put it all together. They've decided to put their course on a specific platform. Perhaps it's Udemy. The next thing is to upload your content and to get it online. I definitely suggest um, doing cloud bulk storage or bulk uploading. Udemy does have that feature now. A lot of the platforms do. Skillshare used to, but doesn't anymore. But Teachable does, Thinkific does. And it's great so that you can just put your all your course files on Google Drive or Dropbox and automatically import those files to any of these platforms. So I definitely think that it's worth it to um, invest in cloud storage. And a lot of these platforms, it's it's free for a lot of space. I think Google Drive right now is 5 or 15 gigabytes of storage for free. Um, so that's 15, yeah. 15, yeah. So that's awesome. Uh, that's enough for several course, courses. Um, so... Put it up on cloud core, uh, cloud storage, um, and then actually putting together the course outline or uploading those lectures to Udemy. The only things that all the other things that I want you to keep in mind are, you know, you have your se- section course sections, and those are like the groupings of your lectures. We talked about that earlier when we outlined our courses, so that's pretty easy. You just follow your outline, and then with Udemy, at least each lecture you can write a description and so a lot of people skip this part but i think it's beneficial to write out a short two to three sentence description of each lecture because it adds seo value to the landing page because this text does end up appearing on the landing page of the course and so using keywords that are related to your course title and also the specific lessons is important because people might be searching on Google for that topic and your course actually might show up as a result. So definitely take the time to write out course lectures uh, or course the lecture descriptions. Um, Anything else in terms of just uploading that you think of? Um, No, and then I just want to, well, real quick, I want to add for the lecture descriptions, I've, I've started doing more of a copy and paste type thing where I say, in this course, you are going to learn and then I'll just put three or four bullet points. I feel like I'm getting in the SEO content. I used to like hand write out every description. And when uh, you have 100 lectures, that becomes uh, very um, time consuming. Yes. Yeah. So now I have, now I have just a general kind of layout that I use for those. Uh, you'll want to upload any kind of downloadable content, mm-hmm. any resources, PDFs, um, any extras that you have for that course, you want to go ahead and put them, uh, in there also. Um, and then, you know, we have the question of when you have this downloadable content, do you make it a separate lesson or not? Um, I think it kind of depends maybe on what type of content you're adding. So if I'm teaching uh, maybe um, Photoshop or development and I have a file that they are going to follow along with, so I'm going to teach them how to do something in Photoshop and I give them the base file, I'll probably put that in the actual lesson and mm-hmm. say, hey, go go download this file so you can follow along. If I have something that's maybe like a resource 
um, that's a little more involved. Maybe it's like a checklist or a curriculum. I'd probably put that in a separate lesson and then talk about that individual resource as I see fit there. Yeah. Um, so a downloadable content is another one. Uh, one question that I had for you that I always think about is when you're uploading this content, do you find that it's better to upload it as you create it, or do you think it's better to batch upload and batch uh, descriptions all all in one go? Like mm-hmm. sometimes I feel like um, I feel like I'm getting more accomplished if I finish a file, upload the file, do the description, then it's done and I don't have to worry about it. Other times I think to myself, well, why don't I just create everything and then upload it all together and then go through and write out all the descriptions? I kind of go back and forth, but what's your preferred method of that? I mean, I think it's probably time time wise, it's probably faster and more efficient to batch it all. So batch your descriptions. But I do see that if you are finishing lectures and just the act of uploading it to Udemy and publishing it is can feel good. And also something that I I actually do that sometimes too is just the uploading aspect of it. It's c- c- cool to see like how much time a course Mm -hmm. is so you see like you upload 10 lectures it's an hour and a half and then you're like okay that's cool let's add some more and then you can see kind of how your course grows in length um so i think for me i do sometimes bat or upload lectures or upload them to the cloud uh whenever i finish them but in terms of like the descriptions and things like that i usually batch that and then actually for the rest of this stuff that we're building out on Udemy specifically, like writing your course landing page, choosing your target student info, course messages. I usually just do that all in one go. Um, Mm -hmm. Sometimes I even start with that before I even create the course and then I'll edit it depending on if the course content changes as I create it. But sometimes I actually like having it all written out and ready to go because this is my least favorite part, writing out and building the course itself. So having it, when I come up with a course topic and I, I actually go on Udemy, I create the course page and I write out all the information for it. So when I'm done recording, it's basically all ready to go. Um, mm-hmm. That's something that I, I like to do too. Yeah, and uh, I would also say as far as uploading goes, um, one thing to consider uh, is maybe when you're bulk uploading, do it at nighttime before you go to bed. Um, I've bulk uploaded before and totally throttled our modem. And when you have uh, two kids and a wife with iPads and TVs and games and everything going on, you can upset the family very quickly by uh, (laughs) throwing a bunch of files to be uploaded. Yeah. So let's let's talk about um, this is a little more specific for you to me. Um, you might find it on other platforms. Uh, it's something you want to keep in mind, even if you're self hosting, because you want to have this in the copy of your landing page, which yeah. we'll get into uh, in another episode. But the target student. So, you know, who's your target student? Uh, who is this course for uh, and what are they going to achieve Um by taking your course, I think, uh, is very important to think about, even if you're not doing it on Udemy. Now on Udemy, it gives you those actual boxes and you have to fill those in. I think you have to have at least one of each of those. What are the requirements of the target student? Uh, who should take the course and what will they achieve? You have to put those in to be listed on your landing page. So, um, so what is just say like requirements? What would we put in that box? Yeah, I think, and the overall kind of advice is that you want to be specific here and you want it to be clear who the course is for and if there's requirements. Because if someone gets into your course and they realize, wow, I need the latest version of Photoshop, but they didn't have that as a requirement, then they might be upset and they might get a refund or leave a poor rating. With all of this stuff, uh, you want to make sure that you're matching the student's expectations throughout um, all of these things. But really for requirements, a lot of it is maybe if you're teaching a software or something like that, you would want them to have the software so that they can follow along. If it's a specific version of the software, then that's great. It's also on Udemy, they prompt you with what knowledge and tools are required. So you might say something like, you don't need any experience 
in this topic. So if you're teaching a course on baking bread, then you might say in this section, you need no prior experience baking bread. Or Mm -hmm. you might say, you need to know how to create a basic sourdough bread for this class or whatever. Maybe you're teaching a more advanced class. You might have as a requirement taking a previous class or having a previous skill under the those requirements. Um, so that's very good, it's, or it's good to be specific there. In terms of who should take this course, again, this is just your chance to like really clarify who this course is for. Is it for beginners? If it, is it for advanced users? Is it for people who are using a specific uh, software or or not? Um, it's for both who it should who should take this course and who might not this course be for again just matching expectations and then lastly with the what will students achieve or be able to do after taking this course this is a really important section because on the udemy landing page this is at the very top of the page right mm-hmm. below the heading right below below the subheading and so this is your chance to really bullet point the benefits of your course. And so think about the overall benefits of the course, but also maybe some more b- specific benefits. So if you're teaching a course and I'm looking at a land, this page that I'm actually writing out myself for a course that's coming out in July on 3D animation, um, you know, maybe one of those benefits is you will learn how to animate your th- own 3D videos or 3D animations, but there's also maybe specific things like you'll learn how to model and shade and texture your characters, or you'll know how to rig a 3d character for animation. And so using this to have like specific skills that people will learn that they might be thinking of like, Oh, well, yeah, I'm going to learn that in this class. Um, so that's, that's really important. And this is really almost more important. This section on Udemy is more important than the actual description of your course because it is prioritized up top on your landing page. Yeah, and I think that, like you said, it's important to be specific here. Um, I find that the better, the more specific you are toward the type of person that you're teaching, the better outcome you're going to have. Because when you connect the person with the course and it's a great match, you're going to have better reviews and you're going to have more sales because Udemy is going to see that. They're going to rank you better and everything's going to work out better. You you don't want to say who should take this course. Uh, anyone who wants to learn Photoshop it probably isn't the best because maybe a lot of people want to learn Photoshop, but if it's a beginner course and someone who's advanced in Photoshop comes in that course, they're going to say, well, this is for beginners. Why did I buy this? And then maybe give you a bad review, which hurts your ranking. So I think being specific is very important uh, in this aspect. And I also like what you said about maybe writing this beforehand. So you want to think about these things before you even start your course. Like seriously, who is going, who needs this course? Why do they need it? Why are they taking it from you? And what are they going to achieve? Mm -hmm. Um, I believe that whenever I do, what will students achieve? Like you said, maybe focus on the benefits a little more than the actual things they are going to learn in the course. You can have some of those in there. Um, but I wouldn't put like, you know, if I'm doing a photography course, I'm teaching you how to use a camera. I probably wouldn't write. You're going to learn f-stop. You're going to learn aperture. You're going to learn white balance. You're going to, you know, yeah. I'm going to put. You are going to learn to be a better photographer, so you can start your own photography business. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're kind of more focusing on the benefit that the student's going to actually learn than some of the specifics in the course because people who are taking your course probably don't even know what all those things are anyways. Yeah. So you might be able to put a couple of those in there, but I wouldn't just sit there and list out every single thing the the student's going to learn as far as details. I don't know if that's necessary. And I think that's something you could include more in your description just to have yep. those keywords in there. But like you said, it's probably better to use that valuable space for more just the overall <laughs> benefits. So That's the target audience page, Um, but this stuff can also be used for your own landing pages on your own site or within a description if you're writing it out on Skillshare or somewhere else. And we also had the previous episode uh, a few few weeks ago or so about course copy, so Mm -hmm. make sure you check that one out if you're more interested in actually how you write out title, good titles, subtitles, and course descriptions. 
Right. On Udemy, the next sort of step is if you go to the landing page page, uh, after you write out the title and description of your course, you have more basic info like choosing a category. So what is your process for choosing a category and subcategory for your course? This kind of stuff, I don't know why, but I love it. I love doing research in this area. I have a extensive uh, Google sheet that has all the categories and subcategories in Udemy and how many courses are in each. Um, so I really love looking at this kind of stuff. I don't know why data to me is just really interesting. So usually I, I'll go through, and I mean, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, if I'm teaching yoga, and I go on you to me, I mean, it's only going to go in health and fitness and it's only going to go into the subcategory of yoga. So mm -hmm. a lot of these are going to be pretty self-explanatory. Uh, you don't have to think too much about it. Um, however, you do want to be careful. There are going to be some times where you need to make a decision where it's going to work best. So if I'm teaching a Photoshop course, I need to think about what type of course I'm teaching and who who is the target student, which we just talked about. Um, is that target student a photographer or are they a graphic designer? Because you can use Photoshop for both. You can use it for web development and, and web design. So in that aspect, I really need to go into the categories and subcategories on Udemy and figure out which one is going to be best. Um, I could put it in the design category and then I could put it under graphic design. I could put it under design tools because it is a design tool. Um, so those kinds of things, you'll want to actually go in, click on those categories and see what courses are in those categories. If I go into the subcategory of graphic design and I see that there's a thousand Photoshop courses and then I go into design tools and I see maybe there's two Photoshop courses, do I want to compete in graphic design because it's a better category with all those people? Or maybe do I want to do an, a, a less uh, a less competitive subcategory like design tools where there's not so many Photoshop courses? That could be beneficial. So you're going to really want to kind of go through and click on the different categories, maybe write down the ones you think would fit best, and then do a little bit of research on uh, what category would work for you. And this can be on other platforms too. Skillshare has their own set of categories mm -hmm. that you also want to look at also and see where you fit in those categories. And if and you're wondering like where you even where begin, you, you can go through and actually like go into the category menu on Udemy to try to figure it out or just search for your topic and when you search for a topic and you go to the course landing page, you can see what um, category those that course is specifically under. So it'd be good to check out what like the best sellers in, you know, if you are teaching Photoshop, search for Photoshop and see what category the best sellers are in. And, and like you said, you have to decide, do you want to compete with them or find another subcategory that might give you a little bit more um, presence on the on the on the site. That being said, you still want to make it match students' expectations. So you're not going to want to put your Photoshop course under Java programming just because Java programming is a more popular category and there's no Photoshop courses in there. That's yeah. not going to work. Uh, and I don't even know if that would be allowed. There might be <laughs> something that comes back on Udemy that says you need to change it. Um, but just, just matching expectations. But there is sort of that a lot of wiggle room in terms of what subcategory you you might want to choose. Correct. Yeah, and you and you want to go through them because different uh, subjects can be used across multiple categories. Yeah. After you have the categories, um, something new that they added maybe a year, year and a half ago. I don't know how long it's been now, but they started doing these topics. So mm -hmm. on Udemy. It says, what is the primary, uh, what is primarily taught in your course? And this gives you a chance to fill in a couple of, um, a couple different topics or keywords relating to your course that isn't necessarily the category or, or subcategory. So for instance, if I'm teaching Photoshop, I put my course in the design category and the graphic design subcategory. Then when it says, what is primarily taught in your course, I could put Photoshop. I could put Photoshop retouching, I could put graphic design, and it gives me a couple different topics that I can put in. And then it asks me after that, 
from the topics you have selected, which is the most representative? So which one is, is the best? And I put Photoshop. And what mm-hmm. this does is it does a couple of things. It allows you uh, to be searched through topics on the landing pages of the categories. So if I go into the graphic design subcategory, at the top, now they have a couple of topics up there. It might say Photoshop and Illustrator and InDesign. And if someone says, well, I wanted to learn graphic design, but I want to learn Photoshop, and they click on that, now they're going to bring up just Photoshop courses. And I was able to put that in to the uh, primarily taught section on Udemy. I think it's very beneficial. Another thing that it does is it adds you into the Marketplace Insights tool. Wait, did I say that right? Marketplace Insights tool, yeah. So um, whenever you're doing any research, um, these topics are the same that you see in Marketplace Insights that tells you things like the revenue and uh, income and the keywords and so forth. So uh, I feel like these are very important to try to try to get down and niche down. Um, do you have anything else about the topic section? Yeah, no, I think this is very important to like make sure that it's specific to the topic that you're teaching. So this is one area where you, you do want it to be very specific. Um, because it's going to help Udemy send more people to your course ultimately. And that's why they have these primary topics so that they can help people searching on Udemy to find your course. And so um, I don't, I'm not exactly sure. They say like, okay, if you, if you believe your course is in multiple categories that it might have an extra delay for course approval. I'm not sure how long that actually takes. um, But being in more categories is probably a good idea as long as it matches so that that i haven't really i I haven't split test that so i don't know if having it in more categories really helps or not but i assume that it probably probably would um yeah and and it's it's pretty interesting because like i said i've done a lot of research on this a topic like photoshop actually appears in multiple places in Udemy. So if you say that your course is a Photoshop topic, you might actually find that in graphic design, in photography, and in other sections. Mm -hmm. Um, So you will want to do a little bit of research, um, go through the categories, the subcategories, and different topics. Uh, Skillshare offers this also. They call it class skills. So it's kind of like keywords on YouTube whenever you uh, create a course in Skillshare, it'll ask you what are the class skills aside from the category and subcategory. And you can put in, I don't know, I think I think it used to be five, but I think they let you do more now. Mm-hmm. And you can put in things like Photoshop, photography, retouching, or what have you. And it does the same thing. When people are typing in Skillshare for Photoshop, you're going to have a better chance of being found if you have that class skill on your actual course. Yeah. So at the end of the day, it's just mostly... Again, picking something that matches the student's expectations. What would they expect to be taught? That should be your class skill or your your primary topic. So after you set up that, there's the other things like uploading your course image and your promo video, which we've talked about earlier in previous podcast episodes. One other special thing on Udemy is that they have what's called the course messages. This used to be called the automatic messages. But these are messages that are automatically sent to someone who enrolls in your class and then ends your class. And I like these. I think it's a great way to just kind of get people in, excited about joining the class. Some students, like it's automated, but some people think it's a personal message, which is great. You want it to sound personalized. And I, a lot of students understand that it's automated, but it's still good. a good place to have a quick hello, a quick introduction to the course. And potentially, you might want to include some FAQs that people are asking about. That's something that I started doing with our latest photo course because a lot of times I'll get questions from students like, how do I get my course certificate? Or are the lectures downloadable? Or how do I access this course? Or where do I start? Or when do I start this course? And so in the welcome message for this new photo class that I launched, I included just a quick section of notes that said, like, you can access this course anytime on the Udemy website or via the Udemy mobile app. You can Mm -hmm. download these individual lectures 
uh, via the player settings. You get the certificate at the end of the course. Uh, there's no start or end date for this course. You can take it out at your own time. And then I also say that please ask questions on the course's Q&A dashboard. Uh, and I just say that this is better than sending me a direct message because I usually have, uh, it's faster for me to respond there. So um, there's just like quick things like that that I think are good for including in the automated welcome message. And then the congratulations message or the message that sends, it's, is sent to them when they complete it, you can really say anything there that you want. But I just say a congrats that we're really thankful for you as a student, that um, we know that it's a lot of work to complete the course and you're one of the few that has actually completed it. So it's just like a quick way that you can automatically connect with students. Is there anything that you're doing or any kind of response you've gotten from these automated messages? Yeah, you know, I never used these until we did our course together. Um, and it was still kind of new when we did our course, yeah. but I had, I had never even plugged them in. And then I saw you put it on our course and I was really amazed at the response that I got back from them. Because like you said, it's an automatic message, but man, a lot of people respond to these yeah. things. And so I used to not do it and I've started adding them to all my courses now. And it's just amazing how many people reply to that message. Mm -hmm. Now, even if you do an automa uh, automated response and then they reply to you, I will usually go back into my messages because you'll get a notification and I will reply back to them. Most of the time, it's something simple like a smiley face or it'll be like, hey, I can't wait to start. To, uh, they'll say, I can't wait to start on the course. And I'll say, OK, great. Uh, look forward to having you in there. Something real yeah. quick and sweet. But it just shows them that you're a person. It shows you shows them that you're still there, that you still care, that you're available if they have any questions. So I always go back and reply to any messages that I get. Even sometimes I just do a smiley face. I feel like it still shows them that I'm here for yeah. them. Yeah, you know, so, it's um, funny. That, Some students will say, like, respond to the automated message and say, "I know this is an automated message, but <laughs> I appreciate it." And then I'll follow up and I'll be like, "Hey, John, thanks so much. <laughs> yeah. I, I really am glad that you're in the course. So it shows that you are actually there." Mm -hmm. And one thing yeah. I do because I do respond to a lot of the automated response or the messages that are the same. It's just thanks or yes, I'm excited. And I'll use a tool, a Google Chrome plugin or ex uh, extension called Auto Text Expander. Mm -hmm. And that allows you to set up uh, keyboard shortcuts that have uh, text set up. So I have one that says, um, let me see what it says. Let me see what I use this for all kinds of things, not just for responding to these messages. But I have one that says, uh, you're welcome. Thanks again for enrolling. And then from Phil, because there's a lot of people that just, uh, that just say thanks. And so I'll just, you know, I have the keyboard shortcut U1. And whenever I type in U1, it expands to you're welcome. Thanks for enrolling. Uh, and so that's one sort of t tip for making it uh, more efficient because it can add up when you get a lot of these messages. That's for and sure. And that's, that's called Auto Text Expander? Auto Text Expander for Google Chrome. Yep. Nice. Yeah, I've, I've heard of it. I've never used it. But yeah, yeah, apparently you can just hit a couple of keys on the keyboard and then it figures out that this is for that specific message it, that you're trying to type in. It's great for responding to reviews on Udemy, for responding to assignments, for responding to questions that you always get. Uh, it's definitely saved me a lot of time and it's free. So it's cool. Nice. Now, another thing um, that you might want to do is look at other people's messages. I mean, we always think we have the best thing going on, but <laughs> a lot of the time I will, you know, enroll in a course and see what other people are doing. Um, I know as far as Phil, Phil has taught me a lot, um, you know, verbally, but he's also taught me more by me just following in his footsteps and seeing what he's doing. So I'll look at Phil's landing page and see what he's written, uh, he's written out mm -hmm. and kind of take information from that. The same thing with these welcome messages. I've tweaked my welcome messages and some of that has been from Phil's courses. I, I have, you know, I will to the, this day, I still buy 
your courses. Um, and when I do, it's great to see what you're changing and what you're doing differently. So your new photography masterclass, I went ahead and paid for it, bought it, uh, and enrolled in that class. And then I can see, you know, what are your welcome messages look like? What is your promo announcements, educational announcements look like? That's something that you definitely want to do. Um, mm -hmm. and, and Phil's a great resource for this. He's one of the top Udemy instructors. You've got over 80 courses now. Um, so you've had a lot of practice and you've had a lot of trial and error. So, uh, I recommend, you know, anyone out there to go buy one of Phil's courses and get involved in seeing how he does it. And then you can kind of copy some of that stuff and make your courses better also. Oh, I really appreciate that. Uh, that means a lot. And yeah, I would appreciate anyone that enrolls in my classes to check out my stuff, but also <laughs> go to the best sellers in your category because yeah. the way that people sell programming courses might be different than how I sell photography courses. That's right. So definitely um, enroll and follow people in your own niche for sure. So the, and then or go ahead. I, I, okay. I wanted to add one more thing real quick here too. Uh, we're talking about specifically Udemy and the automatic messages, mm -hmm. but this can be the same thing mm -hmm. if you're doing an email response in your self hosting. Yep. So in our previous episode, we were talking about using Teachable and you had mentioned uh, I believe you use ConvertKit with Teachable, which allows you to send out emails based on someone subscribing to your course. You could do the same thing here. So if you're self-hosting with Teachable, someone enrolls in your course, set up an email sequence to automatically fire an email to that person and say, you know, hey, thanks for enrolling in the course. And then talk about some of those things you mentioned for the course messages, uh, a welcome, a quick intro, frequently asked questions, mm -hmm. let them know that you're here for them and that they can re reply to that email and talk to you if they have any questions. So I just want to throw that in there also. It's, it doesn't have to be just you to me. Think of ways of doing this outside of you to me too, if you, you know, you're self-hosting. Yeah. And know that there are some rules though on Udemy of what you can include. You can't like send people automated coupons or discounts or pr you can't promote with these messages. Uh, but if you're self-hosting and you're emailing, that's another opportunity to, well, for one, directly send people links to course, like the intro to the, your course or to the course itself. You could also send them links to related content or something that they might be interested in. Um, as well and then also like with reviews this is something that I used to ask for people to like review the class but there's a lot of stuff that's changing and the rules around how you can ask people to review your class is a little bit tricky now on Udemy so I've actually gone through and taken out basically all of my requests for reviews from these automated messages because I used to actually prompt people like please leave a review for the class um, when you have a chance or we hope you think it's a five-star course, or we hope you enjoy the course, but now all the rules are a little bit, um, it's it's dicey to, to be doing that because they see it as kind of manipulating how you get reviews. So just be careful. I think Udemy probably has a page on their, um, in their sort of FAQs about what the rules are with your course messages. So check that out as well. The last thing um, that we want to talk about today is choosing your course URL and using short links for your course. And this is something that you won't do on Udemy until you actually hit the publish button. But if you're self-hosting, it's something <clears throat> that you can set up yourself pretty much at any time. On places like Skillshare, you, won't have, you don't have the opportunity to create your own unique URL. Um, but on Udemy, it's pretty cool because you can. So Mm -hmm. I want to hear you your ideas first about like what what is your strategy and what do you think is like the right way to do this on Udemy? Um, so typically, what I look for first. So when you hit that publish button and it says what do, what do you want your URL to be, it usually pulls the title that you've given the course, which is great. So if I called it the you know Photoshop Masterclass, learn Photoshop in 21 days, that's going to be the URL. Now that might not be the best title. Uh, Photoshop Masterclass is great. Learn Photoshop in 21 days. I don't know if I want that long that long URL being there or not. Typically, what I would recommend is trying to first go for the simplest one keyword word that you could use for your course. And I'll tell you why in a minute. But so for instance, say I'm teaching ConvertKit, which is an email marketing software. Um, 
the first thing that I want to try to do is use ConvertKit only. So mm -hmm. uh, that way the URL becomes udemy.com forward slash ConvertKit. The reason why is it's so easy to give away. So if anyone says, hey, do you have a ConvertKit uh, course or you're talking about it, that's a very easy URL to remember. Udemy.com ConvertKit. Now, I thought about this. And as you were talking, I was like, I'm going to go over here and plug this in just to see if that is a used keyword. <laughs> and it brought up your course on ConvertKit. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Phil Ebener and Dennis Smith, who's also an amazing instructor, uh, has a course on ConvertKit. And if you go to Udemy.com forward slash ConvertKit, it brings up their course. So I think that that's genius. I think that if you're, you know, Photoshop is probably taken uh, HTML is probably taken, but if you're teaching something that maybe is new or not so well known and you can get that one keyword, I think that that works really well. Now, if you can't get that keyword, I recommend trying to make it, um, keyword friendly for SEO purposes. So if I'm teaching like Photoshop, uh, I don't know what I would call it, but I definitely have like Photoshop and course and some of those keywords that people might be looking for on Google in that title because when people search on Google for Photoshop course, Udemy is usually one of the top uh, choices on Google because mm -hmm. it's such a big platform and has so much traffic coming to it that Google will search the URLs wow. of those courses. So you want to have uh, some of those keywords inside of your URL. If you are saying like, you know, how to use the pen tool in 21 days, Many people probably aren't searching for that in Google, but they might be searching for how to use a pen tool in Photoshop. So I might yeah. use some of those keywords in that URL. So that that's kind of how I go about it. What are some of your recommendations? I mean, I think that's pretty much it. I would definitely, I would definitely edit this though. I wouldn't leave it as what your course title is um, because a lot of times your course title might change. And we have course titles that are like Adobe Photoshop, the first the, yeah learn photoshop in 21 days where those last few words in the url url are are meaningless um so i usually try to just have like like you said the key the main keyword like photoshop and then i'll have like course or class in the url because that's a word that people are going to be searching for on google and that helps the seo so if the url is photoshop dash course or even Photoshop dash class or online dash Photoshop dash course using the keywords like that, I think is good. Um, but more, the more simple, the better. That being said, I don't find myself like sharing Udemy URLs that much. What I do is I create a short link through my own website, video school online. Uh, and I use the plugin pretty link to create a short link for all of my courses. So I have like videoschoolonline.com slash photography course or something like that. And that'll go to my photography course. Um, mm -hmm. So so yeah, I wouldn't worry about it being too long, but also I guess, yeah, the more simple, the better, I would say. Um, I, I would definitely try to get a couple keywords in if possible. Um, you were talking uh, about the course title changing, and I made the number one mistake here with my first course. So my first course that I ever made is now called Canva Beginner's Guide. When I created the course, I left the URL with the title of the course, and this is what the URL is, which doesn't help at all. It's udemy.com forward slash create stunning images with no graphic design experience. <laughs> That's what I called the course. Canva is nowhere in that name whatsoever. I would have been better off just calling it udemy.com forward slash Canva or Canva course or Canva beginner's guide. So yeah. yeah, definitely stick with the main topic, have those keywords in there. Uh, but I wouldn't get too carried away with a long URL like that, unless you're trying to get some keywords that make sense in there. Yeah. And I look back at my, uh, first key, <clears throat> my first URLs and I have udemy.com slash video editing, which is not terrible but this is a course on final cut pro 7 and not many people who are searching for video editing are going to want this course back then or even now and so having final cut pro would have been better um mm -hmm. same with like 
I have udemy.com slash kinetic typography, which isn't bad, but it's kinetic typography in After Effects. And I think that's kind of necessary for people to know that it's an After Effects course and people are going to be searching for kinetic typography After Effects um, more so than just kinetic typography. Now I look at my latest and it pretty much follows the same pattern. I have udemy.com slash YouTube dash marketing dash course. I've got udemy.com slash Adobe dash illustrator dash course. I've got a new Final Cut Pro class and it's udemy.com slash final cut pro course. So I pretty much stick to that structure. (laughs) You want to have those dashes or the hyphens separating out the words because if you have video editing uh, with no hyphen or dash and it's all one word, uh, that's not going that's going to look at it as one word in yeah. Google. Um so when you put the hyphen or the dash in there it separates out those words. So when people go to Google they're typing video space editing, they're going to have a better chance finding your course if they're separated by a hyphen or a dash than if you wrote video editing as all one word cuz no one's typing that into Google that way. So if you are using multiple words, make sure that you are putting those hyphens in there. For sure. Man, well, I think we crushed this episode again. A lot of specifics related to Udemy instructors. So hopefully, if you're teaching on Udemy, you can take a lot of these tips and put them into practice for your new courses or go back to your existing courses and edit all of this stuff. You can edit everything except for the URL, actually. So totally go back and do that. Um, in the ne- And of course, if you're off of Udemy. You can use a lot of these strategies off of Udemy as well. And it's also going to be next episode is going to be really beneficial because you'll use a lot of these same tips, but in building your landing page. And so we're going to go over an anatomy of a good landing page using our own experience, but also experience that um, other people and other top online course creators are using. So we're going to break down what you need to include in the landing page and how you lay it out to optimize for sales. So Jeremy, as always, great chatting with you. Everyone, I hope you enjoyed this episode and uh, we'll see you next week. It's going to be a good one. Bye. See ya.